This is Free to Exchange, the show where free markets and free thinking scholars meet. I'm your host, Ben Powell. On today's show, we're going to discuss whether markets in all goods and services should be legal or whether some markets, particularly those ones many people find repugnant, should be prohibited. First, we will discuss how technology has changed the prostitution market and whether these changes alleviate some of the concerns that people have with legalized prostitution. Then, on the second half of the show, a philosopher will join us to consider a wider range of repugnant markets. My first guest is Dr. Greg D'Angelo. Dr. D'Angelo is an assistant professor of economics at West Virginia University, an affiliated faculty member with WVU's Center for Free Enterprise, and he's a former Red Raider. Greg, welcome back to Lubbock and to the show. Thanks, Ben. It's great to be back in West Texas. All right. So, Greg, you've done a lot of work on criminal justice and enforcement issues generally, but particularly recently you've been studying illicit markets in prostitution. That's right. Uh, maybe we could start with, you know, stuff that people mostly know, but it's good to get on the, on the table. But historically, what's the setting of how these markets provided these services? And I don't mean, you know, it's the world's oldest profession. We don't <laughs> have to go back to ancient Greece. Just say pre-2000, what was the typical prostitution market like? Yeah, that's a great question. I think, you know, a lot of people have a, a rough understanding of what they think these markets look like. Um, but in general, these are two-sided markets, and people sometimes forget that Men are looking to meet up with women, and women are typically, if we think about men and women, uh, you know, you're going to be thinking about them as coming together and, and wanting to exchange services. Uh, and prior to the internet, uh, this was mostly done on street corners. It was done, you know, out and about uh, in the, you know full view of, of the public. It was very rare that anything was that was going to uh, there was any of these services were going to be exchanged. That that was done using any other medium except for meeting up at specific locations, largely in cities, but uh, in spe specific locations that were almost predetermined, uh, you know, ahead of time. So a brothel. Yeah, it could be a brothel um, or it could be literally a street corner where it was known that people would go in and be willing to provide those services. Um, so, so yeah, typically that's where a lot of these services were going to be offered, where it's going to be at a brothel or on a street corner. And this makes for a, a difficult matching market for buyers and sellers. Though. Absolutely. I mean, uh, if, if one has preferences, a specific set of preferences, it could be awfully difficult to, to fulfill exactly the preferences that, that one might have uh, if you just can go down the street and only have one or two or three people there that are offering these services, you might not find exactly what you're looking for. So uh, that, that might not be the best way. It, might, it may not have been the easiest thing for a lot of these, uh, these individuals who are trying to get these services. Well, and meanwhile, there's many of us who don't want to see this either. Absolutely. So what are kind of the standard objections traditionally against legalized prostitution in this type of market? Yeah, I think it's, it's essentially th there's three reasons that people don't like it. Uh, one is they don't want to see it. And there's a certain uh, moral repugnance to seeing these services being offered, these, these intimate services essentially being offered uh, for sale. There's that, that argument. Um, a second, the second argument that a lot of people will bring up is um, a public health concern uh, in, in that uh, this could be, you know, uh, exacerbating the transmission of, of STDs. And uh, a third concern is that uh, this could be uh, encouraging uh, individuals to force people into these markets. So essentially, human trafficking could be promoted by allowing these services to be offered. So that's, those are the main reasons where there's a lot of pushback against the legalization of prostitution. Those make sense to me. And in the uh, internet age now, mm -hmm. so post-2000 and, and beyond, how is that changed the nature of this market? It's, it's been a fundamental overhaul, essentially, of this market. So where women used to meet up with men on, uh, um, out, out on the streets or in brothels, and they would use these sort of intermediaries to, uh, to match men and women, that's now being done by the actual service provider themselves because uh, specifically when Craigslist, the, the website that many people are familiar with, came online, uh, this allowed for a, a matching market to occur online rather than on the streets. And this generated an incredible amount of safety for these, for these women, and, and it's also safety for the men as well. But how does it generate this safety? Yeah, so what, what we basically found is that uh, when Craigslist 
introduced a service, well, when Craigslist started to offer its services, we'll say, uh, to a bunch of different cities, some of these cities ended up getting an erotic services section. Some cities got this service section, this erotic services section, and other cities didn't get this erotic services section. And the nature of that erotic services section enabled these men and women to go online, specifically, let's, let's think about women, they would go online and offer services. Men could then go on, find the person that most closely matched their preferences, and send them an email and try to set up an opportunity to exchange services. And through this process, what we ended up finding is that in those cities where women were able to go online and offer their services, uh, they're, they're able to, to basically move indoors. In addition to moving indoors, they're able to screen these men to make sure that they're not matching with a violent, a potentially violent John. And they're also not matching with a police officer, um, which are the, their main concerns. And in doing this, we find that the number of female homicides go down significantly. So let, let's get to the safety statistics in a minute, but let's more on the mechanism there. Mm -hmm. How do they screen them to ensure safety just by being online? I'm online all the time and I yeah. see people I've got no idea about. The amazing thing about markets is, is that they're extremely effective at lots of things and safety is one of those things. So many in many instances, these women will be able to screen these men by asking for them to, for example, uh, if, if anybody's ever applied for a job, it's the same process. They'll actually ask them for a, a letter of reference from a previous service provider that will basically say, yeah, this is a person who was on the up and up. They treated me respectfully. You're not, you know, you don't need to be concerned about your safety with this per particular person. And meanwhile, the, the Johns are less concerned about the safety of the person they're matching with as, as well. well. Yeah. So it's a, they're two sided market. So, so the Johns are very concerned uh, in, in these instances about matching with a police officer because they don't want to get arrested and that would really, you know, negatively affect their lives. So uh, in through this process, these men are also able to learn that they're not matching with a police officer because they're giving a bunch of information to this individual. But also uh, websites have have popped up that enabled the men to learn that this is a, a well-known service provider and that she has a track record and that she's you know going to provide the services as promised. So I can imagine people watching this at home right now and hearing all this and saying okay that makes sense but why is this a good thing and I guess the first part of your answer might be something about the safety that you started getting to. How dangerous is this profession for um, women? It's extremely dangerous. Uh, this is the most dangerous profession for women. Um, and, you know, by the numbers, if, if, if those uh, appeal to you, it's, you know, about 200 women per 100,000 that are in this profession will be murdered. The next closest profession for women is liquor store clerks, where about four per 100,000 will be murdered. 200 versus four. This yeah. is a staggering... It's a huge statistic. ...difference. So what do you find then in terms of magnitude of this, of when cities... Uh, when Craigslist, for example, comes into a, a city and allows them to match online versus on the street, how much safer does it become right. for women? So when we compare locations that have this Craigslist erotic services section to locations that do not have this section, we find that after that, that service is offered to those cities that will get this erotic services section, we'll see a, approximately a 17% reduction in female homicides. In, in, in the years after. And that's overall, not just among prostitutes, but a 17% reduction in female homicides, period. All female homicides, yeah. That's a massive reduction. It's, yeah, absolutely a massive reduction. And to further reinforce it, this would cost billions of dollars in law enforcement to get a similar effect. Oh, so you've studied what will happen of, if you, of police force ratios to lowering female homicides. Yeah. So if you, were, if you were to try to achieve the same effect that Craigslist had in terms of female homicide reduction or female safety, um, it would, yeah, you'd be talking about tens if not hundreds of billions of dollars that would be required to generate the same effect. And there's effects beyond murder too in terms of, there must be in terms of uh, rapes or possibly even STD effects since they're able to screen clients better? Absolutely. So... Uh, it, it actually is the first thing, you know, to go back to what we were talking about before, the public health concerns. We actually find that 
the public health concerns go in the direction that you might not anticipate in that when these women are better able to match with men that are not going to be hurting them, of course we get the reduction in homicides, but we also see a reduction in the number of female rapes. We see a reduction in STD transmission, and we see a reduction, uh, interestingly, in other forms of violence as well, like domestic assaults. Hmm. And thinking back to kind of the standard objections against legalized prostitution, part of it is the moral repugnance generally, but part of it's very specific of, I don't want my kids to see this. Precisely. That, that's one of the most uh, alarming parts of this area of research for me, and it's what keeps me going back to it, is that uh, you know, people don't want to see prostitutes on the street. I understand that. This, this mechanism, that specifically being online clearinghouses, enable them to move indoors, so you don't see these, these transactions occurring uh, on the street any longer. But in a very interesting twist on this problem, uh, regulations in the federal government specifically has cracked down so hard on Craigslist and, uh, and the website that basically followed after Craigslist shut down its erotic services, that's called Backpage.com. They've cracked down on both of these websites so hard that they've both shut down now. And as a result, the services are still being provided, but they've gone from indoors back to the street. We're starting to see early evidence. So Backpage shut down approximately a year ago. Um, and we're starting to see early evidence that women are starting, at least on a small scale, to move outdoors. Where it's more dangerous, less healthy, and more in our face. Precisely. Greg, thanks for joining me and discussing this important issue with us today. Thanks for having me. If you thought this discussion was radical, Wait till you hear the philosopher that I have on next. Stick around. Free to Exchange is a joint project of Texas Tech's Free Market Institute and Texas Tech Public Media. More information is available at fmi.ttu.edu. Welcome back. Joining me now is Dr. Jason Brennan. Dr. Brennan is the Robert J. and Elizabeth Flanagan Family Chair and Provost Distinguished Associate Professor of Strategy, Economics, Ethics, and Public Policy at the McDonough School of Business at Georgetown University. He's also the author of eight books, including Markets Without Limits, which we'll be discussing today. Jason, welcome to this, this show. Thanks for having me. So, Markets Without Limits. So, some people maybe, maybe unfairly have characterized this as, Jay Brennan believes you should be able to sell everything. Yeah. Is this accurate? Well, despite the book, I don't literally think everything should be for sale, but what we're trying to argue in the book is something more simple. If you can do it for free, you may do it for money. So there are things you shouldn't buy and sell and trade, but there are things you shouldn't have in the first place. I shouldn't sell you nuclear weapons, I shouldn't sell child pornography, I shouldn't sell slaves, because no one should have these things. But notice that it's not the market making them evil. Like if I gave you a gift of a slave, that would be okay, but if you buy it, it's evil. Rather, it's just evil to have it in the first place. But otherwise, the view is if you can do it for free, if it's permissible morally for you to do it for free, then it's morally permissible for you to do it for money. Right. So I can't hire a hitman because it would be wrong for me to ask a hitman to kill somebody for free. That's right. The wrongness isn't about payment. Yeah. The money does not introduce evil where there wasn't any to begin with. Um, and the contrary view, which is widely held, is that there's all sorts of things you can do for free, but you shouldn't be paid to do. Like, you can, I can give you my baby to adopt for free, but not for $10,000. I can give you a kidney for free, but not for $10,000. I can, uh, um, we could have sex, but not for money. Um, why do people think that? So you've certainly hit a couple hot topics there right off the bat. So right. let's take them and I'll try to voice some objections and you tell me what you think. I yeah. think, so like giving away your, your baby for money, I mean, doesn't this just degrade or disrespect human life and, and the baby that you're giving. Isn't that what people think? Yeah, so there's this really, uh, I call this a symbolic objection to markets. There's this really widespread view that put, to put something for sale is to express the wrong attitude towards it. It's to show a lack of concern for its intrinsic value or its sacred value. People say this about selling body parts, about selling children, about selling admissions to colleges and all sorts of other things. Um, but my worry about a lot of, it, these are meant to be independent objections. It's not meant to be, well, when I sell you the bait, like if I sell you a slave, I disrespect him because I'm violating its rights, but rather, even if you had a market where no one was being exploited, no one was being harmed, everyone was being benefited, it would still be wrong because it expresses disrespect. So what people right. say just, about- Just to be clear, we're not talking about selling a baby, you're talking about transferring parental rights- Yes. 
AKA adoption. Yeah. If you can do it for free, you could do it and pay $10,000. Yeah, exactly. So the idea is like, there, I, there, I shouldn't just give up my children to anybody. Like if you're a pedophile, I shouldn't let you adopt my children. But suppose you're a fit parent, according to whatever theory of fit parenting is, then can I sell you parental rights then as long as you're already a fit parent? So if it were, it's okay to give you the kid for free, could I do it in exchange for cash? Could you pay me for giving up my children? Um, so with these symbolic kinds of arguments, what people are saying is like, no, it expresses disrespect for the human body to sell a kidney even though it saves lives. Or it expresses disrespect for, human, for babies to sell adoption rights even though economics tells us this would actually um, get more kids taken out of orphanages and put into homes, into better homes. Um, they still say, no, it's disrespectful. But my worry about this is that what expresses disrespect is sort of a convention. So take, for example, if I were to stick up my middle finger at you right now, that would express disrespect. But it's not because it's like written into the fabric of the universe that sticking up the middle finger is disrespectful. It's rather just a social convention that we have that it means that. And we sometimes would have reasons to change that convention. First of all, we could just change it. You can I just agree right now. If I stick up my middle finger, that will mean I, I, I respect you. Do you agree? Sure. Sure. So it, great. So great. You're welcome. I'm now, I'm now showing respect for you. Thank you. Yeah. But now imagine that we learned something weird about sticking up your middle finger. When you stick it up, it creates weird vibrations in the air, which when it gets to your body, kills any cancerous cells that you happen to have. If we learn that about that, that motion, what we, the right thing to do would be to change the meaning attached to it. We might like start giving each other a middle finger as we walk past the street by strangers. That makes sense when you talk about these other things. Well, what about selling kidneys? Like, that practice would save lives, and yet we just treat it as, well, that has to mean disrespect. Um, so I think, the pro I think with that, we have a conflict between markets that can save lives and social practices about what counts as respectful. What should give way are the social practices. We should save lives instead. Man, it's always fun to have a philosopher on the show. Uh, but I, I get what you mean. That it's so Because we've done an episode on kidneys of this before and about how we could just eliminate the shortage and save lives. And if the only part that holds us back is, oh, that's kind of icky. Well, we should change our norms around it is basically your message. Yeah. But there's other objections too. So think about like, uh, as we get more advances in medical technology and uh, I mean, you can sell eggs, but then you might be able to modify them and make somebody better off. Well, wouldn't this advantage rich people who could pay for this against poor people and create more inequality? Yeah, that's right. So there's a question about the safety of doing this. And I think we all want, if there is genetic technology, we want it to be safe and everyone agrees to that. But suppose it is safe. Suppose we manage to do it in a safe way. People say, I'm worried that rich people will be able to afford the technology and they're going to give their kids extra advantages and poor people won't be able to afford the technology. And that'll be a disaster because it'll lead to increased inequality. Well, some things to think about. One is... Uh, Normally, when new technology becomes available, like CDs or DVDs or computers, they go to the rich first who pay for the infrastructure of developing it, and then it becomes cheaper and cheaper to produce it, and over time it becomes available to everybody. That's been the course of history for every technology so far. It'd be surprising if this were the one exception to the rule. So I think we want the rich to get these technologies because that's how we get them available to everybody, and we want people to be happier and healthier and to be more advantaged. And the very act of having a market in these things would create an incentive that's to right. bring the technologies forth. That's right. But even if, even if contrary to what I think the facts would be, it led to permanent inequality, it actually led to the bifurcation of the human race into two distinct species, a more advantaged and a less advantaged species, that could still be a good thing even for the less advantaged species. And we know that's just from basic microeconomics. Uh, an example of this would be, imagine that we human beings encounter the Vulcans from Star Trek and suppose that the Vulcans are genetically superior to human beings. The wor Everything we can do, they can do better. Like the, our best basketball player is worse than like a little toddler for them when it comes to playing basketball. Our, our greatest scientists aren't as smart as like their dumbest people. Um, what does that say? Would, what would that tell us about cooperation? Well, economics tells us through the theory of comparative advantage that we would benefit from trading with them and they would benefit from trading with us and we'd be better off in that system. So I don't think the equality would lead to would be permanent, but even if it were, it would still be worth it. We'd all be better off with it than without it. So another objection that I can hear coming to this, though, is that it's, it's going to be corrupting to, to ourselves to engage. So it's not just that, I, that it, it degrades humans if you sell adoption rights, but that it's going to be corruption, corrupting ourselves by engaging in these transactions. Yeah, there's this thought that like buying and selling certain things makes us worse people. 
And um, there's certain experiments people bring up which they think lead to that conclusion. I, I don't think that they do. So one is something like, there's this famous experiment in Haifa, Israel in the 70s where people were picking up kids late from daycare. And an economist said, why don't we introduce a fine and see what happens? And it turned out when they introduced a very small fine, people picked up the kids at an even higher rate late than before. Which sounds, and so the, some people interpret that as, I felt bad that I was picking up my kids late, but then when you made it a monetary transaction, I didn't care anymore. So maybe, but another way of interpreting that is, I thought I was really putting you out, and then you put a financial penalty on it, and you made the financial penalty, penalty really, really small, which made me realize, oh, I was mistaken. I wasn't actually putting you out very much. So it doesn't necessarily mean that moral markets are crowding out morals. So I think that experiment, which is the one that everyone cites, is the one and only one they use, is really ambiguous. If you go look at all of the other experiments, there are actually people, a number of economists like Herbert Gintis and others have gone all around the world doing experiments where they look at um, opportunities for people to be unconditionally generous. Will they cheat one another for money and games? Will they show trust towards people? And if people show trust in them, will they deserve that trust and act trustworthy in response? And there are these ex games that economists play to sort of test character. It turns out that one of the biggest cultural predictors that you are fair, honest, trustworthy, and that you won't cheat in a game is the extent to which you come from a market-oriented society. People in socialist or traditional societies are much worse in character than people in market-oriented societies. Hmm. So in our last few minutes here, let me, let me toss you some softballs here maybe, or just things that most people think there, sh there shouldn't be markets for with a price. Mm -hmm. And you can tell me if you agree with them, disagree, and, and, and why. Okay. So, uh, marriage markets. So, you can pay someone to marry you. Well, you know, already markets, in like mar marriage is a kind of exchange. People marry for love, and that isn't always necessarily going to work out in the long run that well because emotions fade and so on. But when people are getting married, we already expect them to think about it. Like, responsible people think about things like, are you going to be a good partner for me? What will you provide for me? What will I provide for you? And uh, you know, in introducing payment in that kind of relationship, it's it's already there. We have things like engagement rings and so on. Why not just make it more explicit? Um, it might give people a chance to get married who otherwise would not. Difference of degree, not kind. So I imagine then you have no problem with the sugar daddy websites and things like that where people agree to be a long-term yeah. dating partner. Yeah, you know, when you ask people what's so problematic about those um, websites, they say, well, it's intimacy without, without love. And it's like, okay, so this is a nice example of what I'm talking about. Your problem with the Sugar Daddy website is not that it's paid sex, it's that it's casual sex, non-intimate sex. So your problem, it wouldn't matter if they were doing it for free. Like, I'm sorry, it wouldn't matter if, they're doing, if they were doing it for free, you would still have a problem with it. The money just makes it happen more. And actually, when you look at a lot of the objections that people have to things like prostitution, oftentimes their complaints simply amount to the fact that it's casual sex. Uh, there's a philosopher at Michigan uh, named Elizabeth Anderson. Which, which could be right or wrong, but that's separate from yeah. whether the money makes it wrong. Exactly. So what I'm saying is, if you can do it for free, you can do it for money. And then there's an interesting open question for some of these things, can you do it for free? But when you look at the objections people have, they imply, no, you can't do it for free. And if all is trivial, you can't do it for money. Their complaint isn't actually about the market when they think about it. So in our last minute, let's bring it home to roost here at a university then of, of something that's sometimes controversial. That they say you're selling admissions. So yeah. to wealthy alum who have a kid who's, well, maybe not as bright. Well, we let him in anyway, and he pays more. And, yeah. uh, some people say that's inappropriate. It should only be based on, on merit. Yeah, so I think you know, universities have a lot of leeway in how they structure admissions. Now, if you publicly say, we're only going to allow people in on merit, and then you don't, you're lying. So the problem is that you're lying. On the other hand, imagine a university called uh, you know, For Sale University, and they say, we're gonna, it's, it's a great university that gives a great education. We're not gonna determine on the basis of merit. We're gonna do it entirely on the basis of willingness to pay. That seems fine to me, too. The reason it seems problematic is because some universities are sort of being dishonest. But they do have reasons for engaging in legacy admissions. The obvious one is, well, people will give the school more money, and then they can redistribute that money to other students. It's, the you know, rich kids who are getting to Harvard sort of unfairly are the ones that are paying for the poor kids who otherwise wouldn't be able to go. And it's true that really that transfer really does take place. But there's another separate economic, uh, kind of empirical consideration, which is that 
Universities are often looking to have a well-rounded class, and part of the reason for that is to make it more attractive for you to be in that class as a student. You benefit from being around certain kinds of people, and they purposely bring in people that have been raised with sort of upper middle class mores, who've been educated, have a history of being educated, to ha have them exert social influence on the other students to kind of bring them into the fold and train them to be among the educated, to speak the right way and eat the right way and have the right attitudes. So. Part of the reason they have the, the legacies there is for your benefit, so you will befriend them and become like them. Well, thank you for joining us on this provocative topic on the show today. And I, I guess I should say, uh, I didn't pay Jason to be here on the show today. Uh, <laughs> but if I had, I think he would have given the same performance. <laughs> I know my guests on today's show talked about some controversial topics that many people are uncomfortable with. But let's think about them for just a moment. My first guest described a market for prostitution where technology has been eroding some of the standard objections against it. And without passing judgment on it being good or bad, he simply points out that prohibiting this technology often makes the consequences we don't like even worse. On the second half of the show, we had a philosopher tell us that he thought that not all markets should be legal, but that anything that you should be able to do for free you should also be able to do for money. That adding money doesn't make something that is otherwise correct suddenly wrong. I think there might be something to that. It's worth thinking about. I'd also add that when we prohibit doing things for money, people still try to do them for money. And often then, the consequences in the black market are much worse than what they'd be if they stayed in a legal market. I'll see you next time.